Um, so we're here for Ed Shun, Schaun, <laughs> whichever. Um, uh, he's going to do his talk on cloud ABI, so I have no idea what that is. <laughs> so I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, so I have to use both microphones. Oh. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, sorry, my last name is a bit hard to pronounce. It's Schouten. Uh, yeah. So, um, I, um, uh, before I start giving my talk, I'll sort of shortly introduce myself. Um, back in 2003, I started studying. Uh, while I was studying, uh, there was this, um, we didn't have any wireless internet at our university. So, what I did is I became a member of the Unix users group because they had a hotspot running. Simply for that reason, I became a member of them. So, um, apart from, I used the wireless for a couple of months, and uh, you know, then I started to become interested in all the machines that they had there in that room. So, that was when I started to uh, use Linux, um, Solaris, FreeBSD, all sorts of random Unix-based operating systems. Now, I'm, I'm a big FreeBSD fan personally, but I also use Linux on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, over the last year, I've been developing something. Um, called Cloud ABI, which I've been building because I'm not really happy about the direction that large-scale cloud cluster computing is, is taking. Um, so what I'm first going to do in this talk is I'm going to explain what I think is wrong with Unix. Everyone sort of has different opinions about what they think is wrong with Unix. Um, but these are the two things that I sort of simply dislike about Unix. And one of the, uh, one of the things I dislike is this, the operating system itself doesn't really stimulate you to run software in a secure way. And I'm going to explain that in a minute, what I mean by that. And also one thing that I don't like is that it's pretty hard to write software that's both reusable and testable. So what is this security thing I'm talking about? Like what, what's wrong with Unix security? So um, consider the case that I want to build a simple web service, for example, that runs on a Unix-based system. The requirements for that service are, in theory, quite simple. The only thing it would need to do is it um, receives incoming TCP requests that it needs to pick up, you know, fetch the um, requests, then open a certain file stored on disk at a certain location, fetch its contents, and then serve it back uh, over that same HTTP or TCP socket. It could also use a couple of database connections to some backends and uh, maybe also some log files. But still, if you sort of list all of the things that the system would need to access, is actually pretty much confined. And if you sort of look at a, a, a traditional Unix web server, could be Nginx, could be Apache, um, et cetera, you actually see that once a web server is compromised, so an attacker manages to exploit a um, buffer overflow attack, somehow manage to take over control flow of the application, then the attacker can do a lot of things that are like far outside of the scope of what the web server is sort of intended to be doing. So it could, for example, create a tarball of all of the files that are stored on disk world-readable files at least, and then send them back to some server on the other side of the world. Uh, it could fi fill up slash temp and uh, make the system run out of disk space if slash temp is not in a separate file system. It could invoke set UID utilities and also do some pretty evil, <coughs> scary things. So at least on FreeBSD, the cron tab executable is um, uh, set UID, set GID by default, meaning that you could just install cron tab entries for that user um, the web server is running as. So what you could do is every hour or every couple of minutes, you could spawn a backdoor that you can use to log in on that server that you've compromised. So even if a systems administrator would upgrade the web server software to the latest version that's no longer vulnerable, um, if the sysadmin forgets to check the cron tabs or you know, any of those um, configurations that are generated by SetUID utilities, then um, the attacker can still log in after a couple of minutes, which I think is pretty bad. Even if an attacker doesn't manage to um, run the set UID utilities or fill up the file system, then that system can still be used as a general botnet node. You could, for example, do SYN flooding uh, perfectly fine from within a compromised web server. So um, you see that over the last couple of years or the last 10 or so years, uh, ever since I started visiting conferences, you see that people are trying to solve this in all sorts of different ways. And um, in my opinion, you could sort of um, place these systems in two different buckets. Uh, one bucket I would call access control-based systems, and the other one I would call capability-based systems. So let's first take a look at the um, um, uh, access control-based systems. Uh, 
An example such a system is AppArmor. I could have also picked SE Linux. But what I dislike about this approach is that it's sort of an afterthought. The application has already been written, and then we somehow want to sort of staple security, uh, security against it. Uh, it's, it's an afterthought. It wasn't part of, it wasn't part of the design. Um, and what you see is that because of that, the burden of writing such a configuration for an application such a, such a security is also placed on, for example, package maintainers, but also on end users in certain cases. So the people who haven't written the application, they somehow need to judge what the application may or may not access. And you often see that these configurations break over time. So, for example, a new version of the C library is being used, and it has a somewhat different access pattern on the file system. It now depends on certain additional configuration files in slash EDC. Well, then those security policies will need to be updated as well. And getting it right is a really tedious job. So what you often see is that um, once these applications get out of sync or don't work anymore, the user only has one option, and that is to disable App, App Armor or SE Linux. They can sort of, uh, in, in some cases, fix it themselves, but a sort of a novice Linux user would only would just Google for this error message that uh, he or she would be getting. And the top result would be, oh, that's because of App Armor. So they do another Google search for disable App Armor, and it gives them some kind of app get command that they can room, uh, run to remove uh, App Armor, and they're done. Problem solved. So um, these systems, they're, they're not easy enough. They're not intuitive enough, in my opinion. So a couple of years ago, I got really interested in a system that was added to FreeBSD called Capsicum. And um, I guess there aren't that many FreeBSD users in this, in this room, so I'll sort of, uh, there are a couple of them. <laughs> but I'll briefly explain how Capsicum works, and it's, it's actually a fairly easy concept. So what happens is that a program starts up, um, for example, your web server. It opens all of the resources that it needs. So for example, it will open its uh, networking socket. It will call socket and bind. It will also um, acquire file descriptors for all of the files on disk that it needs. So for example, it opens the directory containing all of the files that need to be served across the web. It opens its file descriptor. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it opens its log file that it uses to sort of write log entries for all of the requests. And then it invokes this magic system call called cap enter. And what happens is that the process is sort of annotated in the kernel that it's, be, that it's locked up from that moment on. So what happens uh, after the process is locked up? The process can still use all of the file descriptors that it has obtained before calling cap enter. It can even create new file descriptors in certain cases. It can still create pipes. It can still open files that are stored underneath directories. But it no longer has any access to so-called global namespaces. It can't just open an arbitrary file on disk um, simply by path name. And it can't also um, create a TCP socket and connect to some kind of node on the other side of the world and send arbitrary data to it. That's simply prohibited. And this security framework is now being used by um, um, quite a lot of utilities in FreeBSD. I mean, here are just a couple of examples on the slides, but there are far more as far as I know. So for example, the DHCP client, um, <coughs> just make sure that it sort of has access to all those resources. Um, TCP dump is also a really good example if you think about it, because this program only needs access to two resources on your system in the simplest case. Namely, it needs access to the Berkeley packet filter that it can use to capture incoming um, network traffic, and it needs to write stuff to your terminal. But still, we run it as root in practice. So that means that if there's some kind of buffer overflow in TCP dump, an attacker could just spam this network traffic all day long, just send UDP packets in the background, waiting until the system administrator runs TCP dump as root, and then you could compromise the system. So there are quite a lot of sort of sensitive applications that we run as root that do some really nasty things like packet parsing and TCP dump. So my uh, late last year, so it's already 2016, so late 2014, I started using Capsicum in an application that I was writing, sort of a pet project. I was writing a networked, <coughs> networked uh, storage service, um, just as a hobby project, and I tried to use Capsicum in there. And I noticed that it really works as advertised, so it's really robust, it's well implemented, it, it gets the job done. But what I also realized at the same time was that code isn't really designed to have system calls disabled. So as soon as you call cap enter, a lot of functionality, a lot of APIs in the application, they sort of become broken as a result of that. 
this not only applies to Capsicum, but this, this also applies to things like SecCom, PPF, and Linux. Um, any security framework that just disables system calls on sort of like the boundary of your application um, has this side effect that it disables or breaks a lot of functionality that is sort of of features that are provided within the application. So it already starts off with the C library itself. So localization becomes completely broken after you call cap enter. So if you want to run a web server that can, for example, print time, uh, print strings using mul multiple character sets or can print t uh, time in multiple time zones, all of that stuff breaks as soon as you're in um, capabilities mode because um, those library functions that will simply try to open files from user share zone info or other files stored in user share slash EDC, and they simply cannot be accessed anymore. And it's sort of really hard to judge within a really large application, um, like from the outside, whether it's sort of safe to call cap enter because of that. The worst issue I ran into was the following one. I was using a crypto library um, called libtomcrypt, and I think this issue even applies to OpenSSL on Linux if you were to implement something like this, where the library will first try to open dev view random, to get random entropy for its crypto. And if that fails, it will simply fall back to using get time of day and get bid. So outside of capabilities mode, this crypto library is completely safe to use, but as soon as you start to sandbox your application, it starts to become insecure. You sort of get the opposite effect of what you try to achieve. So I'm, it's sort of really sad to say, but I think that um, approaches like Capsicum, but also second BPF are sort of really prone to um, Heisen bugs, Mundle bugs, and Hinden bugs. I'd only heard of, of, of Heisen bugs before, but I did some Googling, and apparently Mundle bugs and Hinden bugs are also a thing. So, um, yeah, Capsicum simply doesn't scale. It, it works for tiny applications like Ping and uh, TCP dump and DH client, but I'm afraid that for sort of the, the larger applications, so uh, f think about larger network services, uh, sort of an off the shelf web server, something like this would never be able to work. Um, Chrome, however, um, uses second BPF on Linux to sandbox its browser tabs. And the reason why it works for them really well is that because all of the code that's being run inside of the browser tabs is developed in-house. They make use of third-party libraries, but they're all built into the application and they're all really tailored to work well within a browser tab or within a sandbox. But the problem is, if you would just dynamically link against a couple of shared libraries that you just install from the package manager of your operating system, you're going to have a really bad time. So the second problem that I have with Unix security is that um, Unix makes it actually pretty hard to run programs directly on top of it that you don't trust. So if you would just go to a random website that you, you know, some kind of compromised website and download an application from there and download it and run it directly on top of your Linux workstation, your workstation is, can effectively be compromised really easily. The code is just executed directly. The attacker can access any of the files in your home directory, write stuff into your bash RC, for example. It's, it's a huge mess. So what you could do instead is you could just run it inside of a FreeBSD jail or a Docker instance. You know, there you can sort of more safely start up an application. But the problem is with those approaches is that the attack surface that the kernel has is incredibly large. So, um, uh, for example, um, inside of a Docker instance mounting Procavess, there, it, it's a file system that contains so many individual files, each having their own file system permissions, and all of those things would need to be audited to actually ensure that it's safe to um, uh, expose something like that to the application. So, um, I, I think, so uh, where you can also see this in practice where like the, people don't really trust this is, for example, um, Google nowadays offers a, um, uh, a, a Docker-based um, cloud computing service where instead of virtual machines, you can simply spawn Docker um, instances or uh, Docker images on top of their cloud platform. And if I understand the details correctly, what they do is um, every individual Docker instance gets its own separate virtual machine to run it in. So from a systems administration point of view, it's slightly easier from your side because you can now use Docker. But still, from a security point of view, it's, um, it's pretty bad. So in the end, the only uh, safe thing to do is to run an application inside of a virtual machine, in my opinion. Um, so this brings me to the question, why is Unix not designed in a way where you can 
just run third applications directly on top of your operating system without compromising it. Isn't the operating system designed in the first place to provide this isolation? So enough about security. Let's um, discuss reusability and testability for, uh, for a brief moment. So instead of going to take a, uh, instead of taking a look at um, sort of reusability and testability on, on Unix, let's first take a look at a sort of a different uh, uh, area. Let's take a look at Java programming. If I would write a web server in Java, I could write sort of a web server class like this. Of course, it's fairly incomplete. The entire implementation is missing. But this is just the sort of the boilerplate class you'd start off with. So what do you do when, when you instantiate this object? You will first craft a TCP socket that's listening on port 80. And then in some kind of uh, uh, member of this class, you can store the path name of where all of the files are stored. So we would all agree that this web server is not really reusable in practice and also not really well, uh, not easy to test. Um, it always assumes that you have like that directory available to write your HTTP, your HTML files in, and it also assumes that it can only listen on port 80. You can't even run two of those um, instances on the same system. Well, if you're using uh, sort of a network stack virtualization, then you could, but just running two of these instances out of the box will not work. So after some, then you decide, I'm going to extend the constructor. I'm going to add a port number to the constructor that allows me to provide a TCP port number on which the web server should listen, and I'm going to add an additional argument where I can specify the root directory. This is already a lot better, but still Java programmers would likely agree with me that this is not the, that, uh, the uh, implementation you should aim for. There is something called dependency injection in those programming languages, and what you do is instead of making the object itself responsible for constructing the things it depends on, you provide them literally, uh, you, you provide those instances literally, so it can just only program against it, but it's not responsible for, for crafting them. So for a, a Java-based web server, it would, would look something like this. The constructor now takes a socket object, and that socket object likely has member functions like um, accept connection or uh, send packet or whatever it needs, and it would also have a file system object on which you could call a function like uh, get file contents where you pass in a file name and it just returns the contents for that file. <coughs> and what you can do now is you can test this web server entirely in memory. There is no need to actually craft operating system level sockets. There's no need to access any files on disk. This is fully testable. So now I've explained testing in Java. Now you wonder like where am I going? So in Unix, in my opinion, programs don't really stick to this model. They stick to one of the first two examples. It's either the case that their behavior is hard-coded, and if it's not hard-coded, it's typically that um, it's loaded from a configuration file whose location is also hard-coded. And it takes a lot of time to unlearn applications where to load their, um, uh, which configuration files to load. I mean, for the Apache web server, for example, you can easily specify which configuration file it has to use by uh, using a com com um, <laughs> command line argument, but then it implicitly, implicitly opens a lot of configuration files in slash EDC, like the MIME type database. And that means that you need to specify a lot of configuration attributes in the configuration file to just override that behavior. So you're spending a lot of extra effort unlearning the application uh, where to load its configuration from. And uh, this makes testing a lot harder um, and also really hinders reusability. So I think that this is a double standard. And um, just to show, you can actually use Unix in a way that's similar to Java, where you use dependency injection. So this is a very simple web server that I, I, I wrote some time ago. Instead of being responsible for crafting the TCP socket itself, it simply assumes that standard in is an already bound socket. This is also the concept that INETD uses in a, in a certain way. But you, you rarely see this being used in, on Unix as a whole. Um, and I think that this is quite a, quite a shame. So now that I've uh, been ranting for how many minutes now? 20 minutes now about what I think is bad about Unix. Let's sort of talk about Cloud ABI. As you could have already guessed, Cloud ABI is a separate or is a new Unix environment in which I sort of try to tackle these issues. It's um, based on Capsicum. It's sort of essentially Unix plus Capsicum, but then implemented in such a way that Capsicum is already turned on on startup. So there's no more state transition where your application calls cap enter and enters a sandbox mode. Uh, 
the process already starts up in a sandbox way. And this is actually really nice because it allows us to remove all of the features from POSIX that conflict with Capsicum. So there is no longer an open call that allows you to open an arbitrary file by path name. There's only the POSIX open at function that allows you to open a file underneath a directory. There is no longer a bind call that allows you to bind to an IP address. There's no longer a connect call in there, which, which has a dis, its disadvantages, but later on I'll sort of explain what you can do about, uh, to work around that. And what is nice about this model is that um, instead of having to deal with all those Heisen bugs, Hinden bugs, and Mandel bugs, all of those issues caused by sandboxing are, are now just simple compiler errors. Um, so that, what I was explaining earlier, the scripto library that tried to open dev view random and if it failed it would fall back to get time of day, this library would not compile on Cloud ABI because there's an open call there. So it's really easy to detect all of these issues that are caused by sandboxing. And my claim is that even though um, having the build break is bad, it's the time spent uh, getting that library or that piece of software to build again is far less than trying to figure out why it doesn't work because of sandboxing. So um, on the testing front, because there are lo no longer any global namespaces, it's no longer possible to open arbitrary files by path name, you can't hard code those things anymore either. So the application becomes truly dependent on you passing in those resources in the form of file descriptors and startup. What I think is really important to mention is that um, at a lot of conferences, I get these questions at the end of the talk where people sort of say Cloud ABI is useless because it's not suitable for use case X. Because I can't connect to an arbitrary host on the internet, it is a horrible system and should not be used. But it's important to keep in mind that this is a symbiosis, not an assimilation. Cloud ABI programs can simply be run right next to traditional Linux programs and they can still interact with each other. So. Um, I'm going to give a couple of examples later on uh, um, where I'm going to show how you could sort of cloud ABI ify applications. And uh, one of the examples contains, um, uses sort of a traditional Unix uh, application in combination with a cloud ABI application to sort of sandbox the software. So what can a cloud ABI program do by default? If you would just start it up in its simplest form, just run dot slash an application on the command line, what can it do? It can still allocate memory through MMAP. It can still create pipes through the pipe system call. It can still create socket pairs, shared memory, all sorts of objects that are anonymous and only have impact on the process on its own. They don't have any global impact. They use up some resources, that is true, but it, they're sort of essentially not visible by other processes. The process can also spawn threads and it can spawn sub-processes and all, um, um, spawning threads is sort of done through the pthreads API but spawning sub-processes is done through an extension that is not part of POSIX. I'll explain that a bit more in the next slide. You can still interact with clocks. Um, you can call get time of day or sleep. You can still get random data from the kernel. So uh, just like Linux has this get random or, or get entropy system call nowadays, there is a call similar to that in Cloud ABI as well. But what you can't do is open arbitrary parts and this. You can't uh, create network connections and you also cannot interact with the process table as a whole. So you cannot send kill signals to other processes, even if they're running as the same user. It's simply invisible to the processes. So what do you do if you want to give this program more rights? You start it up with more file descriptors. That's sort of the basic idea. And these file descriptors can be of a couple of different types, but the most important ones are file descriptors pointing to directories or files. Um, as I mentioned before, passing in a file descriptor to a directory allows you to open files underneath that directory. Um, you can pass in sockets to make that uh, application talk on the network. But another interesting kind of file descriptor is a so-called process descriptor. So because you can no longer kill arbitrary processes on the system, you sort of have this restriction that you can't sanely interact with any child processes anymore. So as a replacement for that, um, Capsicum introduced a new file descriptor type called a process descriptor where there's a special fork call and what happens is that the parent process gets a file descriptor that sort of points to this child process. And if you would close this file descriptor, then you automatically send a sick kill to the child process and clean it up. So it's impossible to leave sort of dangling processes behind. 
Another interesting thing about process descriptors is that you can um, select on them. Um, the, the wait system call on Unix for waiting for process termination, for waiting for a child process to terminate is uh, in practice pretty badly designed and um, uh, is, it requires you to install signal handlers in many cases and it's just a huge mess. So with this you can simply poll for the termination of a child process similar to polling on a network socket and it really sort of unifies the way that processes can poll for events. Um, what's also a really important aspect of both Capsicum but also what Cloud ABI supports is that um, file descriptors have permission bitmaps on them and they're really fine-grained. And um, what this allows you to do, for example, is create a shared memory object that is both readable and writable. You place data in it that you want to give to another process. Then you duplicate the file descriptor, remove the write writes from that second file descriptor and pass that on to another application. And that way you can grant read-only access to a piece of shared memory that was open for writing. That's sort of the idea behind it. So um, it's also important to mention these writes are stored within the file descriptor table entry. They're not stored within the file descriptor itself. So if you have two file descriptors pointing to the same piece of shared memory, one of them can still be writable and the other one can still of, can be read-only. That's the idea behind it. It's, it's quite a powerful construct and if you would get rid of this then a lot of things like using shared memory would be a lot harder. So now I've got two examples on these slides of um, um, sort of example Cloud ABI programs, what they would, like, uh, would look like. So a web server could be implemented by just um, spawning it with a single AFINet or AFINet 6, IPv4, IPv6 socket. And this would um, uh, receive incoming requests. You give the read-only file descriptor to its root directory with all of the files that need to be served, meaning that the web server is only capable of opening files stored in that directory for reading. Um, uh, file system permissions in Cloud ABI, they're still um, respected, but um, um, they are sort of not as necessary as, um, or as important as they are outside of sort of a capability-based runtime environment. Um, you would also have an append-only file descriptor to a log file, meaning that an attacker can only append entries to the end of the file. It can't change the mode, uh, it can't remove, for example, the O append flag from the file descriptor, seek back and remove um, overwrite stuff that was in the log file of call or call f truncate on it. You can really step off all those individual writes and up with a file and end up with a file descriptor on which you can only invoke the write system call. And this 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 is like a pretty nice because if this web server gets um, uh, exploited, then an attacker can still sort of take a look of all of all of the files stored in the read only directory uh, with um, the HTML documents, but he or she can't do anything really serious on that system. It's, it's a lot safer in theory than just running a standard traditional Unix web server. Another thing I've been thinking about, and this is sort of to, to sort of show the, the, like the cooperation between traditional Linux and Cloud ABI applications, you could build your own sandbox C, C++ compiler, or someone could patch up LVM or GCC to be, um, to be sandboxed. And the problem with a compiler is that um, you specify the files that need to be built on the command line, and the compiler also needs to access the header files stored in user include, for example. So what you could do is you could just make a really simple startup wrapper, a front-end application, and what it does, it, it parses all of the command line flags, and then it opens the input file, the C source file that you want to compile, and it opens the object file that needs to be written, and it also opens all of the include directories that are built into the compiler, so user include, user local include, and then it passes all those file descriptors onto a cloud, a cloud ABI application that does the actual compilation. So even if things are missing in Cloud ABI itself, with a, with a little, uh, little bit of help from uh, a standard, the standard Unix runtime environment, you could sort of still augment it to be complete. So, what I observed while I was working on this is that once you remove all of the features that conflict with um, uh, capability-based security, then you end up with a Unix runtime that's incredibly compact. So Cloud ABI only has 58 system calls, which is quite small if you sort of compare it. Just for, for reference, the first version of Unix also had, I think, 60 or so system calls. Um, Linux nowadays has, I think, 350 system calls, and FreeBSD has 450 to 500, which is mainly because they don't have the process file system, which means that things that are normally implemented through the file system in Linux are implemented through separate system calls on, on BSD. 
So this is incredibly compact. The entire definition of the binary interface um, is stored in, in, in two header files, and those header files are only 500 lines of code in total. And what's interesting about this is that instead of coming up with Cloud ABI for Linux, Cloud ABI for BSD, Cloud ABI for macOS, etc., I decided to just make it its own sort of non-existent operating system. Uh, you know, when you build a Cloud ABI application, you build it using a cross-compiler for Cloud ABI, and that gives you a Cloud ABI executable. But there is no Cloud ABI operating system out there. There are only patch sets for existing operating systems to make it possible to run these Cloud ABI applications. So I've already managed to upstream an implementation for FreeBSD. So if you install the latest development snapshot of FreeBSD, you only need to load a single kernel module, well, actually well, two kernel modules, and then you have Cloud ABI support out of the box. I also have an implementation for Linux out there that works, well, reasonably. I still need to like, give it a bit more attention. And I've got a NetBSD implementation. And depending on which community shows the most interest, I'm sort of uh, you know, deciding which implementation I have to sort of uh, polish up the soonest. So I, I hope if you guys are really excited about this, then you know, I'll, I'll put a bit more focus on the Linux implementation. So how do you develop software for Cloud ABI? Um, my observation is that it's pretty hard to cross-compile software in general. Um, build systems like CMake and Autoconf, they try to make it easy, but still, in practice, people sometimes still mess it up and make poor assumptions about uh, um, uh, whether a utility that is invoked is meant for the host or for the target system. So um, also coming up with a Cloud ABI toolchain is pretty hard because you have a lot of separate components. There's a compiler, there's a linker, there's a standard C library, there's a standard C++ library, there's an unwinder for C++ exceptions, yada, yada, yada. Um, so building a toolchain yourself requires quite a lot of effort. So um, what I've come up with is um, um, uh, something called Cloud ABI Ports, which is a package collection of pre-built Cloud ABI software. But what's sort of kind of different about this, uh, about this uh, package collection is that instead of having my own package, package manager and command line tools to manage this thing, I build the packages once, and then I turn them into Debian packages, FreeBSD packages, NetBSD packages, etc. So the only thing that you need to do is you need to add a couple of lines to your uh, sources.list if you're on Debian, or your pkg.conf on FreeBSD, and then you can sort of manage these Cloud ABI packages for your native package manager. Um, all of those packages, um, independent of which operating system you're using, they contain exactly the same contents, byte for byte, so it doesn't matter whether you're developing Cloud ABI software on FreeBSD or on Linux, the end result, the resulting binary of your application should also be identical in theory. I've already ported quite a lot of pieces of software. I think I'm up to 80 packages. I mean, it, it's, it's nothing compared to how many packages an average Linux distro has, but there are already quite a lot of interesting pieces of software that you can use to build high-level applications. I've got Boost uh, for standard C++ development. Um, uh, curl, if you want to do HTTP connections, um, even glib, the core library of GNOME applications. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to build any GNOME-ish applications on top of this, but the core library is already ported. Crypto, LibreSSL, and there's also support for one scripting language, namely Lua. Um, I'm still working on Python support in the meantime. Um, and if Python support works, that would be pretty interesting because then I could look into, for example, getting uh, Django web-based applications to work on top of Cloud ABI. So here's an example of how you would just uh, set up a cross-compiler toolchain. These instructions are for FreeBSD, and the reason I'm using FreeBSD here is because on FreeBSD it's most streamlined. Um, I'm still looking for a couple of uh, like uh, package maintainers from certain distributions who want to help with um, uh, coming up with a Cloud ABI toolchain package for their operating system. It would streamline things a lot. So first off, you start, uh, start off by running pkg install Cloud ABI toolchain, which installs a, the Cloud ABI toolchain from the FreeBSD port tree itself. So that's not maintained by me. This is provided by the FreeBSD port tree because the applications inside of that package are FreeBSD binaries. It's a, it's a copy of Clang that is built to run on FreeBSD. So I'm not interested in maintaining those packages. I'm really only interested in maintaining the actual Cloud ABI software. 
So after you've installed the cross compiler, you already have a working compiler, but it can't build anything because there's no C library installed. So then you just um, um, uh, make a couple of changes to uh, slash EDC, and after you've done that, you can install the like the package over there, x86, 64, unknown Cloud ABI, CXX runtime. The name is quite long, but there is some structure to it. So uh, first of all, x86, 64, unknown Cloud ABI is the official cross compilation target name for Cloud ABI and all of the packages have been prefixed with that um, uh, uh, target name. So this will install the C++ runtime for Cloud ABI running on x86-64. Instead of using x86-64, you can also use ARC-64, and that would install the ARM64 uh, C library on your system. And your workstation doesn't need to be an ARM system. It could, it could be any system you like. You could even use it on a Spark. These packages are sort of... Um, hardware architecture agnostic. You can always develop cloud ABI software in any system you like. So after you've installed the, the cross-compiler tool chain and the, the C++ runtime, you can um, just invoke a compiler like you normally do in Unix, cc-o hello hello.c. So now we're coming to the, uh, in my opinion, really interesting piece of the talk. Uh, so over here is a really simple cloud ABI. Uh, application, namely a re-implementation of the Unix LS utility. And it's slightly different than your normal LS utility because instead of taking a path name on the command line, it would now have to have a file descriptor pointing to a directory in which you can call read there. So this is just a really simple loop. It calls fd open there, which opens a directory handle for like scanning through of the directory entries by file descriptor. And then it calls fd open one um, to get a handle to the terminal so we can write the, the path names or the, the file names of the entries in the disk to, to your terminal. After you've opened those and sort of just scan through the entries and print them to the terminal. So this actually works and um, this is sort of how you would uh, run this application on FreeBSD. First you compile it, you load up the kernel module that you need for running Cloud ABI applications and then you invoke ls as follows. Instead of just saying ls space path name, you say ls smaller than slash edc. So it opens edc and passes that onto the uh, ls utility. And this all works. So the problem with this approach is, is that it doesn't really scale for larger applications. ls only depends on two file descriptors, namely the directory and the terminal. It needs to read entries from the directory, write them to the terminal. But if you have a larger web server that can listen on five TCP sockets, can use 20 root directories, makes use of a cluster of eight database backends, can write to 20 log files, then it becomes pretty hard to invoke the web server in the correct way. You have to make sure that in the configuration of the web server you say like, uh, for this di root directory we need to use file script of 48, and then you need to make sure that in, inside of the init script that you use to start of the web server that file script of 48 also matches up with the directory. This can only go wrong, in my opinion. So I, I, I thought about it a bit more, and um, what I came up with is, is the following, a utility called Cloud ABI-run. And it sort of merges the way that you configure applications with passing file descriptors to them. Essentially, your application, um, so string command line arguments, environment variables, they're sort of re replaced in favor of a tree of configuration attributes. So it can be an integer, a string, a Boolean, or it can be a list or a dictionary, and so they can all nest into each other. So you can have a dictionary of, um, of strings mapping to integers, for example. And um, file descriptors are also native types inside of that. So I'm just going to show how it works by example, because then it sort of becomes obvious how it works. So assume that I would want to write a standard non-cloud ABI web server, a traditional unix -y web server. Instead of coming up with my own grammar for a configuration file, I could as well just use YAML for it. Um, there are like lots of libraries out there that can parse this. So this is what a very simple configuration would look like. Um, first of all, there's a hostname attribute that you would, for example, want to send back in error messages. Um, then there is a, an attribute concurrent connections, 64, which determines how many worker processes should be spawned by the web server, for example. And then a couple of other att attributes underneath, namely, listen on this IP address and port number, this is the path name to the log file, and this is the directory of the um, HTML files. So with Cloud ABI Run, uh, what you do is you extend this YAML file, 
to um, have a sort of, instead of listing all of the IP addresses and paths directly, use special tags to indicate that um, this refers to a resource and not to just a string. So Cloud ABI dash run parses this YAML file and sees all those socket and file tags and what it does, it replaces those by file descriptors. So by an FD tag. And this is sort of what's being passed onto the application. And how does the application receive those configuration attributes? Instead of using the traditional int main function that you would normally have in a standard Unix application, you, you now use program underscore main and you get a handle to sort of that tree <coughs> containing all of the, the uh, configuration attributes. And then you have a couple of accessor functions, arc data underscore get star for like the kind of uh, type of value you're interested in. And that way you can sort of traverse over the tree, read out all of the scalar values, but also access the file descriptors. So what's the advantage of using Cloud ABI dash run? Um, so it's, it's not any harder than configuring, configuring a traditional Unix application that uses a configuration file. There is still only a single config file that contains both the configuration and the resources that the program should access. Um, it's, it uses YAML, lots of open source libraries out there for generating YAML, for example, so it sort of nicely integrates into sort of larger setups. And for a software developer, it's also nice. There's no longer a strict need to come up with a configuration file parser. Even the simplest applications can now use a configuration file out of the box. And there's also no need to write any code any longer to acquire sockets, et cetera. So it, it somewhat reduces the, the complexity of the startup code of your applications. So now in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about sort of use cases that I foresee for Cloud ABI, where I think that Cloud ABI would be a nice fit. It'll only take a couple of minutes. So I once worked at a company that uh, built a spam filter slash firewalling appliance, and they used a spam filter um, that they acquired from some kind of third party. It was just a binary blob that they ran on their appliance. Well, spam filters could in theory contain lots of buffer overflows or security issues. I mean, they do a lot of parsing of text. They're, they're, there's quite a sort of large attack surface. So what you could do is you could just run that within its own separate Cloud ABI application that only has one file descriptor for incoming email and one file descriptor in which it writes, this is spam, this wasn't spam. And that way you can sort of easily sandbox a spam filter. Um, high level cluster management. So the nice thing about Cloud ABI processes is all of the dependencies of the applications are known up front. So you could have a cluster management system that makes use of this. So instead of just spawning up a web server without actually knowing whether the database server that it uses is up and running, it already has that knowledge because it has to connect those two together. And this could have some interesting um, advantages. So one example is it could actually improve the locality of such a cluster management system. It knows in which rack it started up the web server, or sorry, the database server. Not, so now it can also start up the web server in the same rack, on the same server, et cetera. So, the cluster management system suddenly has a completely accurate, 100% accurate dependency graph of all the applications that run on it. So, um, yeah, here's also like a really short one. Um, uh, Google has a service called um, uh, App Engine where you can upload a Python or Java application and they run it for you. There's no need to do any server maintenance. The problem with um, uh, App Engine is you can only use a couple of their approved scripting languages like Python, Go, and Java, I think. But with this approach, a company like Google could, for example, safely run any application that you send over them. So it would make it possible to run a Haskell or uh, Rust or application written in any language you like. Google doesn't really care. They just execute the instructions for you but don't really care about the language it's written in. So this is all I wanted to say. Uh, I think I'm sort of over time by a couple of minutes. Well, I'm actually pretty close. Uh, here are a couple of interesting links. So first of all, nuxi.nl, it's the address of my consulting company's website, but it also contains the documentation of how to use Cloud ABI. And there's also an IRC channel on the EFnet that you can join and uh, lurk. Um, and there's a couple of links to GitHub where you can find both the source code of the C library and of the package collection, Cloud ABI ports. Yes. There's a, a few minutes of questions, so if you yeah. just keep Why it short. You the name Cloud ABI? So, 
Yeah, so the, the, the problem is uh, I picked a name initially and then it's insanely hard to change it. <laughs> but also um, because I, um, um, I, I think that the, um, the use case where you have a sort of a cluster management system that actually knows, so what I explained a couple slides ago, has the notion of the applications that it's running, how they're structured, how you can schedule them. That, that is a really compelling use case in my opinion. And yeah, I had to pick a name. I could have also called it, uh, I don't know, like a, after a piece of fruit or... Uh, if, if you have a better name and are willing to sort of uh, regex the entire code base and... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that was also my fault. Yeah. Um, pick any. <laughs> uh, you mentioned needing kernel support, um, kernel modules. What part of this actually needs kernel support? Could you do it with a wrapper that used ptrace or setcomp or something to um, give the restrictions you need? Yeah, so um, on free, so uh, let me explain, first of all, why I implemented this as a kernel module. So when I started working on this, I implemented this for FreeBSD initially, um, because I'm a huge FreeBSD fan. And FreeBSD has this really nice layer in the kernel already for supporting multiple um, uh, binary formats. So they already use this for running Linux binaries on top of FreeBSD. Um, and Implementing it that way is like the easiest way you could implement it. Uh, requires the least amount of code, but it's also like the fastest. There's no emulation overhead or anything. Um, NetBSD is also the same in that regard. It has the same structure in there. Linux is a bit different. It has that layer, but it's not as flexible anymore as it used to be, because in the old days, Linux used to have Solaris support, I think. On Sparks, you could run Solaris binaries. Yeah, yeah but that's sort of all rotted away by now, and it doesn't work anymore. Um, but Implementing it on top of SecComp, for example, could also be done. Or even ptrace, something that's a bit more portable. I'm just considering all you're really doing, from what I understand, is removing syscalls. Yeah, so the, the, the system call table is entirely different. Right. So it's, it's not just removing system calls, oh, it's really okay, a separate so table of system okay. calls. And you could do it in user space, but uh, then you end up with... A, an implementation yeah. that's far larger than patching up the kernel to support yeah, I it. I, I mean, it has the advantage that you don't need to patch up your kernel, but that's the only gain you'd get. Yeah. Just one or two more questions. Um, rotating log files. Sorry, what's that? Rotating log files. Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. There's no question mark in there, but I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so how would you implement rotating log files? Um, so there are multiple ways of, of doing this. Instead of writing to a log file directly, you would have a helper process that would do the logging for you. So a separate syslogging channel, just like syslog on Unix. You, know, you just have a Unix socket in which you write entries and it gets written to disk magically. Or alternatively, you could have a, um, a, a helper. For, uh, you could also have a file descriptor to the directory containing the log files that still has the rights to rename files and open new files, that would be a solution. You could also have a helper <laughs> process next to it that can do the rotation for you and give you the file script to the new log file. There are you multiple can ways. In or do you rely on journal D? Sorry, what's that? Or do you rely on journal D? Yeah, yeah, use other pieces of open source software to do the logging for you. <laughs> yeah, that would also be an approach. So, um, what about neighbors? So, excess memory or CPU use, how does that get addressed with this? Yeah, so one thing that's not part of Cloud ABI yet, and that's mainly because there's no sort of uh, standard for it, is how to limit resources of applications. Right now, I simply assume that there is an infinite number of CPUs and an infinite <laughs> amount of memory. Um, Right now, you'd still have to use it in combination with, for example, uh, the, the, the Linux uh, C groups API to limit it. And on FreeBSD, you'd use the CPU set API, I guess. So that's where you still have to use sort of the, the, the native interfaces inside of a native Unix application to set up the environment for you. But it would be nice if Cloud ABI would also gain some support for doing that itself. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks for all uh, joining.